So, welcome to my commute home. I've been living with this BMW M140i for a week now. It's my car, really, if you didn't know already. Uh, so I've been living with it for like three months now already. But yeah, this is my commute home. Don't worry, we will get onto a B road a little bit later, just so I can sort of, you know, talk about some other stuff maybe. But for now, we're gonna talk about some stuff that I haven't really seen covered in a lot of other reviews. Um, if it has been, I'm sorry, but I watched a lot of reviews on this, obviously, before I bought one. And um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I feel hasn't been properly covered, at least. Number one is this car warms up really quickly, which I kind of underestimated uh, in how awesome that actually is. So a lot of hot hatches these days, or a lot of performance cars, take quite a while to get up to temperature. And if you've got a fairly short commute home, like I do, you know, I'm doing like eight miles each way, um, if a car takes a long time to warm up, I don't really feel like I can push the car that much because I don't want to rev the engine out when it's cold. Uh, but look, so I've been doing four minutes of driving now, what, literally one mile, and if I check my oil temperature, you can see it's already at nearly 100 degrees, which is crazy. And I think that's actually part of the reason why the BMW M140i is such a reliable car, because the B58, you got a closed deck design, so it can handle a lot of power. And the oil's not sitting at a cold temperature, so it's lubricating the engine properly pretty much straight away, uh, which is pretty cool. Next point, gearbox can be sometimes a little bit jerky. Like when you come up to a junction, if you're slowing down and then you suddenly go again, it kind of does nothing for like a whole second. I'll see if I can demonstrate it later. Um, but yeah, it kind of does this weird thing where it doesn't really know what to do, and then it holds on to first or second gear for ages uh, before shifting, so you end up revving the engine to like 5,000 RPM in comfort mode, which feels a bit horrible. And thirdly, here's one thing I had no idea about. Uh, you can tell because I wired my dash cam all the way to the 12 volt socket in the boot, and then realized I didn't have to do that. I mean, there's one in the cup holder, but I didn't really want to have that open all the time. But there is a third 12 volt socket which is actually right under the glove box. I had no idea that existed, and I don't think a lot of other owners know that actually exists. Um, but yeah, that's one thing. Uh, then fourthly, the tires, regardless of whether you get an alignment or not, do seem to wear very quickly on the back. I know that's because it's a rear wheel drive car, but they do seem to wear quite quickly. See what I mean? It revs a lot more than it needs to. But yeah, back to tyres. So apparently the bushes on the back can sometimes become a little bit worn, which can be a cause of a lot of wear on the inside edge of the tyre. But I've just had an alignment done and my car was pretty much bang on, apparently. Um, and according to the Hunter's wheel alignment software, there was nothing really that wrong with my alignment. There was very slightly too much toe in, but that was it. <laughs> so. I mean, maybe the rear flexes a bit and allows the tire to sort of really, you know, like go hard on the inside edge or something. But yeah, from uh, what I could see, what we could see, there was nothing really wrong with it. Um, but anyway, it's all, you know, smiles per mile. Do more burnouts, have fun, whatever. MPG round town, you can see we're sitting at 20 now, but that does go up. And if I put this thing in eco mode, which I did the other day, I was able to get nearly 34 miles per gallon on the way to work. And that's driving on roads like this. Um, obviously I know the road quite well, so I can drive predictably, um, but it does mean, you know, I, I save money driving this car um, compared to other performance cars. Something like a BMW M3, you're not getting anywhere near that. Other hot hatchbacks like my Cupra, the most I could get on the way to work was 32. On the motorway as well, I did 49.2 miles per gallon on the way up to Shrewsbury the other day, which I cannot believe I managed that. That was driving an Eco as well, sitting at like 65 miles an hour, because I had my partner and dogs in the car, there's no point driving quickly. And that brings me on to the next point, which is suspension. If you are driving quickly on some road services, it's really jittery, uh, noticeably more jittery than other cars. Um, it's weird, like some roads that look quite bumpy, this car seems to be alright on, 
Um, but other roads that are kind of smooth, but not smooth enough, it seems to really struggle with. It's really odd. But yeah, it's something to keep in mind. If you're buying one of these, maybe put some money aside for some Bilstein B8 dampers, or maybe if you want to spend a lot of money, go for the bull, the uh, bull, the full bird suspension kit. They've basically mastered a suspension kit for the road for this car. And it is pricey, but apparently it's worth it. I'm yet to drive one. So birds, if you want to let me drive one, reach out to me in the comments below and uh, maybe we can organize something. But yeah, it's just something to keep in mind. For me, it's okay for now. You know, it's not, I'm not in a rush to do it, but it's something I plan on doing as well as a limited slip differential. Then in terms of reliability, so far I've had the car, I've been fairly lucky or unlucky I suppose like the problems I've had haven't been expensive to fix but I have had some issues with this so number one was the pinion seal uh, for the diff that had started leaking literally on my drive home and thankfully the guy I bought it from uh, was really nice and uh, fixed the problem for me car was still under BMW warranty anyway so it was like really smooth sailing got replaced part isn't that expensive but the labor is quite expensive um, and BMW said if I didn't have warranty and I got it fixed there, it would have been £1,280. When the part costs £13, yeah, not exactly brilliant. It is a hard job to do though, it requires a lot of man hours apparently. Um, and then the other thing that has just happened, which thankfully you can actually do yourself, and I'll be doing a video on it at some point later on in the month or next month, uh, and that is the exhaust valve actuator pin. I believe it's called and that's basically a pin that connects the actuator itself to the valve and over time that breaks because it's a stupid design and it's basically you know when you have a paper clip and you bend it backwards and forwards a lot uh, it then becomes really easy to break that's basically what happens to that pin and uh, then you have to buy a new one and just fit it yourself but thankfully it's a really easy fix and the pin only cost me seven pounds on eBay um, so yeah those are all the problems I've had other than that, I've done 6,000 miles of driving now, and yeah, it's been great to be honest. Alright, let's get out of this junction. But at the moment, I have a really horrible exhaust rattle. <laughs> anyway, let's get into Sports Plus and see why this is the car that I wanted. Oh yes, I've actually got another 1 Series behind me that's not a 140i that's trying to race me. That's the one problem you get with this car, is everyone does try and race you, unfortunately. But yeah, when you get on the right bit of road, this car is just awesome. And with a double res delete, it's even better. You can go for a sports cat if you want, but I kind of like just the double res delete because it's, you know, it's almost ASBO when you've got it in Sports Plus. You occasionally get really loud cracks, which I love. Uh, but they, it doesn't crack all the time, which I actually really like because it's just, it's not like, you know, a Kalashnikov. It's not like an AK-47 going off, you know, constantly. You know, it's a surprise. And when it happens, you're kind of like, ooh, that was nice. Then in terms of interior, things like rattles, cup holders, all that kind of stuff. Rattles have been fine, actually. It feels like a really well-built car. Um, I did have one in the boot where part of the trim was basically touching the metal in the boot and it made this like clicking noise um, but I managed to get some felt like with sellotape on one side and felt on the other and managed to uh, fix that pretty easily so now yeah you go over bumps you don't really hear anything oh and sound system the Harman sound system in this is genuinely impressive I have listened to pretty much every good sound system now um, best ones, Mark Levinson sound system is still the best, I think, uh, from Lexus. It's just ridiculously good. Second to that would be the B&O system in the Audi RS3, weirdly. I know, I've heard the B&O system in a lot of Audis, and the one in the RS3 just seems to sound better for some reason. Um, I'm not sure if it's because it's just a small car or something, but it definitely sounds better than a lot of more expensive Audis, which, you know, just weird. But that's just, you know, as I hear it. Then, um, yeah, this is like 95% as good as the BNO system, so this is like third place, really. And then, in terms of infotainment reliability, I've got Apple CarPlay in this, and it's perfect. There's not a single issue I've had with it, uh, which surprised me, really. Um, yeah, but yeah, you just, you know, 
set it to your favourites button, it goes straight through to Spotify. It's brilliant. And I set my favourites buttons up to like destinations and all that kind of stuff. And it's just great, really. Um, one thing that isn't great is the fuel economy when you're driving it quickly. So the B58 giveth and the B58 taketh away. When you are driving quickly, this thing will drink petrol like a freaking alcoholic. It is mad. But, you know, it's a big engine, it's fun, it's smiles per mile. So if you want, you know, if I want, I can go through a tank of fuel in two days quite easily, um, just going to work and back. Um, but then I can make a tank last a week and a half if I want to, uh, which is just weird. You know, if I whack it back in comfort now, it drops to like a thousand RPM because it's such a big engine for the car. It just, it doesn't need revs to go. And it's weird, it never feels like you're lugging the engine. Like look, sitting at 40 miles an hour up here. And it, it just feels like it's barely even trying, which is great. Uh, then next negative would probably be the cup holders. They need grippy bits. Uh, VW Golf R has grippy bits in, which you know, it just makes a big difference. And these cup holders don't, which means if you drink a lot of canned drinks, like energy drinks or Cokes or whatever, they do just flop around and they do spill quite a lot. And these cup holders are pretty difficult to clean as well, which is kind of annoying. Um, what else? Other thing I like is the cruise control in this. This is cruise control with a brake function. Uh, so when you change the speed, uh, so say I drop into 35 miles an hour, I've got something behind me so I won't do that. Uh, it uses the rear brakes to actually slow you down, which a lot of cruise control systems don't do, uh, which is nice. But also if you go around a corner and it thinks you're going too quickly, it slows you down as well. Uh, and it, it's quite preemptive, like you could easily go around that corner at 50, 60 miles an hour before you even reach the car's limit. But yeah, it's trying to keep you safe basically. Okay, exhaust rattle is fixed. Let's go for a proper drive. And I can show you what the handling dynamics are like of this BMW M140i and hopefully why a lot of people mod them. First though, let's have a look at the headlights. Go back into comfort actually. <laughs> Don't want to destroy my MPG for the weekend. As fun as this car is. But yeah, as you can see, the headlights are actually pretty decent in this thing, especially for a little hatchback. Like, for me, they're perceivably as good as the BMW 3 Series, which is good. My previous car, the Seat Leon Cooper, that had... They weren't projectors, they were reflectors, and for some reason they just weren't quite as bright as these. Like, these on a long road, you can see for miles, and they're fantastic when it's really dark as well. But even in like dimly lit conditions, when you've got them on full beam, like you can see all the cat size and signs get reflected miles up the road. So yeah, they're brilliant. Right, let's get on to some proper stuff. Okay, let's get us into Sports Plus. And I'll start off just in Sports Plus for now with the traction kind of like in MDM mode. It's kind of like an MDM mode. See, it reins you in pretty quickly. But the main thing about the BMW 140i that does need changing is the suspension. Now, on a track, it's kind of okay. It's still not brilliant. But you kind of get this, like, almost pogo effect where the dampers can't quite control the rear end of the car. And it's the rear that's the main problem. But so coming around a roundabout in Sports Plus, I've got PS5s all around, so there's loads of grip. And then you can see it kind of lets you have a little bit of fun and then reins you in pretty quickly. just about get through third gear <laughs> before you hit the speed limit, properly hit the speed limit. Now in stock form DSC off, I would only 
personally use myself on wet roads because the limit of grip is lower and the car becomes more predictable then because you've got an open diff. It's kind of just, it's not that predictable in the dry. Oh, tunnel. Sound check. Woo! Now that's why you buy a car with a B58. There might be someone sleeping in that lorry, so I won't do it past him. Yeah, even in fourth gear, the torque you get around corners is crazy. But you can see there, I pushed the car, and around that corner, pretty much all the cars we review can't keep up with it there. So, although it's not perfect, like something like a BMW M3, where you can just, it feels like you're on rails around that corner, this is still pretty decent. But if you want it to be better, then yes, you do need to mold the suspension, put a diff in it, underbody brace, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but in just Sports Plus, I find it has this really nice character where I know it's going to catch me if, you know, if there's a bit of oil on the road or there's something I'm not expecting. I know the car's there to catch me, basically. And I think for public roads, it's a perfect setting because you never really have to worry about anything going wrong. As long as you're like at least semi-competent at driving, you know, if you don't counter steer, obviously you're still gonna crash, but it, it lets you have just that little bit of fun without scaring you, which I really like. All right, let's get onto the motorway now and I can show you one other advantage of this B58. So we're currently sitting at 23 point four miles per gallon and I did reset this trip computer to deal with well not the whole week but four days worth of driving because I'm gonna be doing this and then a mixture of b-road driving I think that's like a fair sort of comparison to the other cars because most of the time I drive this in sports plus so um, it's not a fair representation of this car I think on a side note whack the car in comfort mode cruise control on at 70 it's raining but valve and the exhaust closes and I've got a double res delete no drone whatsoever that's where the double res delete is like such a good mod because it's cheap it sounds almost as good as pretty much any exhaust system you can put on this thing and you don't get any drone at motorway speeds as long as you keep the back locks anyway let's head to our next B road and crack on okay back into sports plus Let go. You can see what I mean, like around this corner. To me, it, it doesn't feel like it's going all over the place. It just feels like you have to have some form of throttle control. Like in the BMW M3, yeah, you feel a little bit more connected to the chassis uh, because you literally are. But this, you know, it feels a little bit, you know, spongier. But it's not like terrible. Like, steering weights up nicely, suspension, it controls the body well enough. Open diff in Sports Plus, it's kind of like trying to imitate a limited slip diff. It doesn't really work, but it, it spins up both wheels almost at the same time rather than at the same time. But in with DSC off, push it around a corner. inspire you with as much confidence but it doesn't completely take away any confidence I think a lot of people go from cars like VW Golf R's into cars like this and then they just think oh it's terrible it handles awfully and I you know because it doesn't just handle like it's on rails all the time or understeers you know, the rear end breaks loose quite easily. People just get scared of it. And they then say, oh, it's a terrible handling car, it can't put the power down. And yeah, when it's wet, obviously, you're not gonna be able to put the power down. A high power front wheel drive car can't put the power down. 
Was that a deer back there? I think it was. I have to be careful on this road. One thing I noticed though, so in Sports Plus, Pigeon, uh, nearly killed Pigeon. In Sports Plus, you notice it it acts more like a limited slip diff in the way it brakes traction. So it brakes traction quite quickly and gives you like a little flick sideways. Whereas in DSC off, it feels a lot more just like an open diff. Even though apparently it's still trying to act like an LSD, which is weird. You can see the handling. It's like it's fairly easy to control. I think this is a good road to illustrate why you kind of need to change the dampers. The GoPro is quite stable, but as you can see, when you go into a dip, it kind of goes up and then doesn't settle. Like a BMW M3 will go up, settle straight away. And it is just the dampers, really. So it's not like it's a, a fix that's hard to do. But I mean, even in stock form, it's not unbearable. You know, I find it kind of, it's like something I kind of want to change in the future, but I'm in no rush. You know, I, I have had cars in the past where you drive them and you think, okay, wow, yeah, I need to change the suspension on this because this is just awful. And most of the time that's like really old stuff. Um, but yeah, this, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. People really do over-exaggerate how bad it is at handling. Like on a dry day, you're going to run rings around a Golf R in this. So that's where the open diff becomes unpredictable. And that's when one of the wheels lifts, you just get no power. <laughs> just, you get this delay and then suddenly it's like breaking the other wheel and getting power to the other wheel. You don't get that with an LSD. But I think it's a good demonstration of why an LSD makes such a difference. Because it just makes the car more consistent. As long as both wheels are on the ground though, it's okay. But you think you combine an open diff with suspension that doesn't always keep that rear wheel with as much traction on the ground as it should have. It, me it makes a combination of slight unpredictableness on certain roads. But I notice in the wet, it's actually a really consistent car and really easy to drive. You know, you can drive around with the traction control completely off in the wet and yeah, it's really not that bad. It depends on driver skill and yeah, if, if you're jumping out of something like a VW Golf R, I could understand why you turn the traction control fully off in this thing for the first time and you would absolutely crap yourself. Um, so yeah, there is that. But if you're used to a rear wheel drive car, like if you're coming from like a BMW 330ci, something like that, you'll think, oh yeah, it's not quite perfect but I know what I need to do to it and once you've done those things the car's like really decent anyway we've got to go and see how big the boot is in this thing now but just this is what I love so if I put this car I can put this in 6th gear yeah from 30 miles an hour watch what happens when I put my foot down just effortless wave of torque and that's the speed limit that's what's so good about the B58 this thing I love about the 140i is these shopping hooks because they secure the bag in place because you've got this parcel shelf that comes down on top of it so no matter how much you drive the car hard the bag won't come off it's pretty neat so, just like that, a week is over. Overall, what has this BMW M140i been like to live with then? Well, it's been lovely, really. Uh, in terms of MPG, 
we've managed 29.4 over the course of 109 miles. That includes when I was absolutely ragging it at the weekend. And um, yeah, I mean, a couple of trips into London, not a lot of proper motorway stuff. And we averaged nearly, basically 30 miles per gallon, which is really decent for a car like this. You think you've got over 340 horsepower, big engine, and you're gonna drive it around in sports mode most of the time. Um, just a side note, as you know, this is my car, so most of the time I do drive around like this in manual. And then your MPG will be a little bit lower. You'll average around 22 to 24, but smiles per mile. Uh, but that, that's the thing about the B58. So if you want to get good MPG out of it, you whack it in comfort mode or eco even, and you just chill out. And the engine sits basically at a thousand revs most of the time you're driving around because it's just such a big engine for such a small car. But the car itself, overall, I'm really happy with this car. And honestly, after driving a lot of other stuff, I can't actually think of anything else that I would want. You know, I've, I've driven things like BMW M3s, which are great, but for daily driving, they're really, they're kind of annoying because the dual clutch gearbox is just really quite uh, jerky at lower speeds. Uh, fuel economy is awful. And you know, if I was a millionaire, I would probably skip an M3 and just get a proper supercar. But I'm not. This is affordable, it's fun. It's not perfect, which I actually really like. But yeah, as I was saying, it's not perfect, which I actually really like, purely because it means I can spend even more money on it, uh, trying to make it perfect. And I think that's what makes a really good car, is if you buy something that's already really good, you kind of immediately get used to it and then it, it doesn't really have a personality because it's just good. Whereas something like this, it's got a stupidly powerful engine for the chassis. The chassis is nowhere near capable <laughs> of handling this engine without quite a lot of help. Um, but yeah, when, once you put things like the strap brace on, you change the suspension, uh, you give it a limited slip diff. There's so much you can do to this car and so much aftermarket support that you can have a 140i, which is a fairly common car, and make it your own. Which means you can then go to car meets and you know, you've set your car up very slightly differently and it, it creates a talking point. And most importantly, the car feels unique to you and it has its own personality, uh, which is something that I find is lacking in a lot of modern cars. Um, you know, for, which for most people is a great thing. But for a car enthusiast, you want to buy something that's like a platform for you to put your own heart and soul into. And that's where this car is so good. You know, even something like a Golf R is quite good, but this, the amount of stuff you can do to this that totally changes its personality is just awesome. And despite all the like minor issues I've had, you know, even though the suspension's not brilliant, the 140i is definitely, I mean, it's up there with one of my favorite cars. And when you think I bought this for 23,000 pounds, what else can you get for 23 grand that's still fairly new, fairly low on mileage, can be mapped up to, you know, north of 500 horsepower quite easily. I mean, a stage one map is 440 horsepower on this thing, that's mad. And will still be fairly cheap to run, it's got cheap parts to replace stuff if it does break. There's not a, it's not a long list. You know, you're either looking at older cars, which break more often, or you're looking at cars that you've got to spend more money on. So as bang for buck cars go, this is really up there. And on that note, I think it's time to end the first episode of the Living With series. If you enjoyed the first episode of this Living With series, please give us a like and why not subscribe as you can see more content like this and you can see everything we have for sale, which we do actually have a BMW M140i 
for sale at the minute which is a fairly similar spec to this apart from the fact it's got electric seats which uh, yeah you're gonna want if you want to get a BMW M140i this roundabout is so terrible by the way <laughs> it's just such a poor design but anyway I digress my name's Tom and you've been watching Paragon Cars I'll see you in episode two I suppose bye bye